You ready to go to Sunday school? You better go to your Sunday school class. Is that your violin? Are you a violin player now? Is that her violin? Should she get a violin? Wow. How cool. That's exciting. You'll be a concert violinist. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, really? That's amazing. Ah, by ear. That's good. Is her ear sore? Oh. oh, wow. Yeah. You're just your ear is sore. <laughs> so, have you heard of the Suzuki method of violin training? Okay, so my, my uh, nieces and nephew learned that. Anybody else heard of that Suzuki violin? So they start them out with a Cracker Jack box with a ruler type t t uh, tape to it. And all they, they learn the, um, how to hold it. And then they, they'll start them at one, two years old with these things. Really? Yeah. So my, uh, my, my nephew and two nieces ended up concert violinists because they, but they have this song, they call it Taka Taka Stop Stop. And it's like, stop stops are the appropriate words. Stop, stop. <laughs> but it's just like, and they learn how to, how to do the, the thing. Yeah, my, my nephew play, plays Orange Blossom Special and all those fiddle songs now. And he can play concert music and stuff. But he'd been playing since he could barely walk. But they, they, teach, him, they teach him how, it's called the Suzuki Method. They teach him how to, um, how to um, you know, from the ear. They learn, they learn the violin like a, like a tool. And they, then they can do anything with it. It's pretty neat. Yeah, they do that with piano, too. This, this, I knew this one kid, his mom, his fingers, he couldn't even press his fingers on the piano. He's two years old. And his mom would take his fingers and push them down and teach him the chords. And now he's 30 years old and he can play anything. He listens to it one time and can play it. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Well, morning, everybody. Sorry about that. Uh, hold that corner up, Jeff. Uh, Genesis chapter 13 is where we're going to start this morning. Uh, we are in a series on reaching your community for Christ and, and what we should do. And today we're, we're in this section called the messenger's passion, talking about the passion, the emotion, the feeling, the excitement of reaching people for Christ. I want to tell you something. Um, your passion is really what you go after. People say, well, I don't have time for whatever it is. Truth is, you always have time for the things you want to have time for. Isn't that right? The things you love, the things you are passionate about, you will find time for that. Right? And so the question here is, if you don't have time for reaching people for, for Christ and telling people about Jesus, the question is, do you really have a passion for it? And I, I, we started just looking kind of at, well, at Lot. The Bible tells us that in, in um, the New Testament, it says that Lot was a righteous man in his soul. But his behavior did not show that, did not demonstrate. It kind of, I just want you to see Genesis 13. It says here, verse 12, Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. You see what his passion was, the direction he pointed himself. See, Sodom, and for whatever it was, it was just, just kind of a pra this is kind of a practical application of the whole story. Basically, kind of shows us something using the story as a picture. So Lot pitches his tent toward Sodom. He's his direction is Sodom. He's filling his eyes with Sodom. That's what he's looking at. That's what he's thinking about. Now, if I were to ask you a question right now, if I say, uh, if you're by yourself and you get to do anything you want to do, don't tell me what it is. But but what would what would that be? You know what would you what would you want to do if, if you do anything at all? What would you want to do right now if, if you had your free time? And money was not an option. What would you be? You know, some people would be going to a ball game or, or I don't know what it is. 
that would be your passion, the thing you're interested in the most in, the thing that comes to the top of your, I want to do this. Well, some of you guys are workaholics, so you would be like working, uh, <laughs> doing something. Uh, so, so some of you would be uh, scrolling on Facebook. I don't know, it's, it's boring after a while, right? But, but um, this Lot's passion was Sodom. And after, in, in chapter 14, verse 12, um, it says, And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, his goods, and departed. And the story, I won't go into all the story right now, but what, what happened was Lot was in Sodom, living in Sodom, and someone came along and they attacked the city. Anyway, they carried Lot and his family away. I am not really talking about that. What I want you to see here is that first Lot pitches his tent towards Sodom. Now in this verse, we find him living there. You'll find yourself the same way, you know, you know, uh, you'll find yourself the things you look towards, the things you think about, that's where you'll end up. Because you're, that's your trajectory. See what you're passionate about. So we find, we find him living in Sodom in chapter 19 Verse 1, it says, And there came two angels to Sodom, and even a lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So what's happening? He's faced Sodom, then he's living in Sodom. Now he's in charge. He's sitting in the gates. That's what it meant when they would sit in the gates. He's, in, he's, he's ruling. He becomes a ruler. In uh, verse 7, and he calls these these men of Sodom come, he, he, uh, what happens is the angels come and visit Lot and they're in this, and these guys, these, these homosexuals, that's what they are. They see these two men, fresh meat coming into town, lack of better term. And they're the, the, the new guys. And, uh, you got, you got some people you haven't shared with us. We got two new men coming in and these, this, the city, the Sodom was so caught up in this kind of wickedness and debauchery. Now they saw two new people and they're like, hey, why, why aren't you sharing them with us? How wicked. I mean, think about a righteous man being in the middle of this. And he looks at them and he calls them brethren. He's got relationships with these guys at a level that is strange. Um... He calls them his brethren. Now, by the time we get to verse 18, the angels are telling Lot, God's going to destroy this city. Verse 18, he, he says to them, oh, not so, my Lord. He's, now he's disbelieving the Bible, which is the word of God. Okay, that's what, that's what we're in, in this application that we're, we're drawing here. The angels said, this is what God said. He's going to destroy the city. Nah, that's not going to happen. Now, He's come a long ways. He had been with Abraham. Abraham is his uncle. He left the city, the Chaldean earth Chaldees, with Abraham. His uncle said, let's go find God. Then he sees Sodom. He's like, boy, I'm going to, boy, I like that. And he starts looking at, boy, that's a rich area. Boy, I like, boy, I could really have, boy, that money. Wow. What I could do with that money. And wow, I could, what I could do in that city. And wow, all that, there's a lot of great stuff there. And so now, then we find him moving into the city, becoming part of the city, making the city his friends and neighbors. The Bible talks about be not unequally yoked together, right? With unbelievers. You've got to be careful with that. In business dealings, in any kind of dealings, when we link up with unbelievers in ways that we should not, they become our brethren and then they start influencing us. Now, by verse 33... They made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And what, what happens here is after Lot has left the city, God's burned it to the ground. He's with his two daughters. His wife has died. He's with his two daughters. They're up in the mountains. The daughters say, we're going to get dad drunk. There's no, we're not going to have, there's not going to, there's no men out here to give us children. So we're going to have children by our father. They get him drunk, and he commits incest with his daughters. See where his trajectory led him. Wow, what a mess. Yet the New Testament says Lot's righteous soul was vexed by the wickedness around him. 
So how can a Christian be involved in such wickedness? I'm going to tell you something. My dad used to tell me that folks that don't, you know, I believe in eternal security. You know that once you're saved, I believe you always be saved, right? And there's a lot of folks that some of the, some, some of the folks don't believe that. And the, the, the thing they point to is they say, well, you know, if you're sinning, you know, God saves you from the sin. If you're sinning, you know, you got to get saved again. Well, let me just tell you something. This is one of the most uh, interesting stories that shows us that's not correct, that God saves the soul and sometimes the body is still involved in things it shouldn't be involved in. And they will pay for it in this life. In this life, you'll pay for it, okay? Because Lot did. He lost everything. But his soul was saved because he's called righteous Lot in the New Testament. And the one of the, well, is actually one of the, the best examples of that. So, well, can a Christian sin? Well, yeah, a Christian can sin and still be saved. You can still be involved. But God will punish you. You will, you, I mean, chasing you. You will, it will cost you in this life. And wow, this is the only life we got, <laughs> right? So we ought to we ought to live it right, huh? Clean it up, and and get the benefits that God has for us here in this life, right? But anyway, wow, my dad used to say this. He said, um, "There is no sin that a there is no sin on earth that a Christian cannot commit if he's out of fellowship with God." But why did we give you this story? Because I want you to see. That even a believer, even a person who is righteous in their soul can have their passion directed the wrong way and be involved in things they should not be involved in and their life can completely fall apart. Now, let's go to the, the, next, the next point I want you to see and that's the passion Jesus had. Look in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Here's the story of, of him and the Samaritan woman. In verse 1, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Verse 4, And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son's Joseph. His son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Now, here's what's interesting: is it says there he he needed to go through Samaria. If you look at your map, you'll find out that Samaria was not really on his path where he was headed. He had to go through Samaria on purpose. And the Jews usually would go around Samaria. They wouldn't have anything to do with it because the Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile. And therefore, the Jews were upset about that. Okay? And they didn't like them. They hated them. And said, you guys are half-breeds. We don't want anything to do with you. And so they would go, they would go all around Samaria and would not go through. So Jesus, on purpose, goes through Samaria. He, he arrives at this well knowing... This woman is going to be there. He on purpose goes there and his disciples leave and he's there by himself and he begins talking to this woman. So he, 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 he makes this side trip on purpose to engage this needy heart. As, as they discuss things, you will see him talking to her through this story. Verse 19, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And, and, and uh, Jesus tells her, goes on to say, uh, uh, you know, you worship in, we, we worship in the spirit. God's a spirit. We must worship him in spirit and truth. And he spends this whole time discussing, answering all of her questions. Uh, she has a question. He answers it. She has another question. He answers it. Has another question. She answers it. Then he asks her questions. This conversation with this woman, taking the time to meet all the needs of her heart. His disciples come back and uh, let's see, where is this? Uh, verse, uh, verse 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat. Verse 32. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. What's he talking about? You see, um, the 
thing about, I don't know, have you ever, you ever been doing something and you were having such a good time at it, you got so wrapped up in it that you forgot to eat? Happens to me a lot. Maybe, maybe it doesn't happen to you, unless maybe eating is your passion. <laughs> you forget to do other things while you're eating. But, uh, but uh, I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever um, been there, but uh, a lot of times we, we just, you know, you just work through, you know, like, what, what time is it? Oh, it's time to eat. You, you're so interested in what you're doing. Happens to me a lot. Um, in this situation, Jesus is so interested in reaching this person's heart. He's so caught up in it. He's enjoying it so much that he said, that is what is sustaining me. See, that's his passion. See, it's what he wanted to do. Look what, look what Paul said about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 19, he said, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And then of the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law to them that are without law as without law being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without law to the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Here's look at look at he's saying here. He says he said I made myself a servant to everyone. To the weak, I'm weak. He identified with everyone. He find some connection point with every person, whatever their race, whatever their creed, whatever their background. And then he put that effort into becoming the best soul winner he possibly could. Look, look what he says. To the weak, I became as weak. To the strong, the strong. To the Jew, I became a Jew. To the Gentile, a Gentile. Um, why? That by all means, I might save some. Um, I'm going to tell you that one of the griefs of my heart is that most people that come to church don't have a passion to reach the lost. If I could inject you with that passion every Sunday, I would. Ah. Uh, trying to think how to say this because I don't want to be misunderstood. I have, I have some convictions. I'm conservative. You know that, right? Some of you may not think I am, but I am. Uh, I'm conservative in, in the way I do things. Um, my, um, the Bible I use is the King James Bible. I will continue to use the King James Bible um, for a lot of reasons. I give you a hundred and some reasons. We talked about that already a few weeks ago. Um, we are one of the few churches in this area that sticks to the King James Bible. There's maybe two others that I know of in this town. Maybe two others. Uh, everyone else is using whatever else that, whatever the other version they can get their hands on and doesn't care about the versions.
I believe specific things about doctrine. Like I believe that I believe that salvation is not by baptism, water baptism. Do you know the Church of Christ believes that water baptism saves you? You know that, right? That you have to be baptized to be saved. I think they're wrong about that. Um, we have the Lutheran church in town. That's a big, big deal because of the school and so on. The Lutherans are almost Catholic. Uh, they believe things are, they, they put different titles to some of the same things. They do some of the same stuff. Like for example, um, transubstantiation is where the Catholics believe they take the bread of Christ or the bread of the, 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 the communion, the wafer, and the priest prays over it, and they said it actually turns into the body of Christ. Yeah, the Eucharist. The Lutherans believe in trance. It's not substantiation. It's trance something else. And they say, well, it actually doesn't turn into the body of Christ, but when you take it into your body, then it actually literally becomes... Christ in you. I'm like, no, still wrong. Uh, the Apostolic Church across town, they believe that if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. Still wrong. Um, I could spend all morning telling you all of the different denominations and the problems in all of those different denominations in this town, including the Mormon church and everything else. But I'm going to tell you that that is not my passion. My passion is not to correct every wrong tweak of doctrine in this town. When I came to Mattoon, I looked at the demographics and found out that 86%, this is what they said 10 years ago, 86% of the people in this town do not go to church anywhere. 86% of this town have no church affiliation, zero. I, I, I've ta I'm talking to middle-aged people all the time who said they've never been to church their entire life. Some of them have come visited here and, and left and said, well, I want to come back, but it's just not a habit in my life. I don't have that as part of my, I've, I've not grown up going to church. I don't know, I don't know how to do this. One, one lady asked me two weeks ago, she said, she said something like, um, how do I pick what church to go to? I kind of want to go to church, get close to God. How do I choose? Well, I said, you know, the best church, Maranatha Baptist Church is the best one. So come to that one, choose that one. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but honestly, it was, it was an honest question. We talked about it. What, how, how do I pick? What do I do? You know, how do I know what to choose? And you think about a middle-aged person that really has no idea about Christ in this town. When I saw the, the need, I realized that one church in town, Maranatha Baptist Church, does not have the answers for 86% of the population in this area. We're not the, we, we, we can't get all of those people into this building even. And I realized that I have to co-labor with people that I do not agree with on them several levels to get the job done. Does that make sense? Now, some folks have trouble with that because their passion is to make sure that everyone else is doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Well, good luck to you. That'll just drive you crazy because no one's going to do what you think. I mean, those of us that go to church together, if we had to live with each other for a month, we would want to shoot each other. Because we all do things differently. We live differently. We have different priorities in our homes and families. The way we do things are different, right? And that's okay. Uh, 
the Bible says that be careful not, if you bite and devour each other, be, be careful you're not consume one of another. There's a lot of room for differences of opinion on how we do things, right? But I found out that the thing that unifies us, it unifies the pastors in town, it unifies, us, it unifies the Christians and so on, is this desire to see people come to Christ. And so, well, a long time ago, I realized that the Holy Spirit is not fragile. That he's not, he's not a little flower that just wilts in, in, in heat. The Holy Spirit's strong. The Holy Spirit's God, right? And if I can get them plugged into him, he's got it from there. And so, you know, um, church membership here is not as critical as getting them to Jesus, right? And so, you know, while I think the King James Bible is like a steak knife compared to a butter knife, you know, in some of the other versions, I think that, I mean... And it's more accurate, and I think there's condemnations on those who take verses out, like the, you know, the NIV is missing some words and verses and so on. I think the Bible talks about that. It says those who take the words out are going to they're, 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 they're be taken out of the book of life, is what Revelation says. So the people that put, put out the NIV, I, I wouldn't give a plug nickel for their salvation. I'm not talking about people that use the NIV. I'm talking about people that print published it, the ones that took the verses out. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. But having said that, I think you can get saved using the NIV. There's enough scriptures in the NIV to, to, to read some. And so I have friends in town that would preach out of the NIV and preach the gospel, and folks are getting saved. And I'm excited about that. I'm over the moon about it. Um, another pastor in town come to me the other day, and he said, what do you think about Pastor so-and-so? Is he even preaching the gospel? And I said, calm down. I did. Calm down. A couple weeks ago, he had 30 people that got baptized and made a, made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not God. I'm just a servant. When, I, when he said, when he posted in the, the minister's little group we have going on, he posted he had 30-some people get baptized and get saved. You know what I said? That's exciting. And I called him on Monday, and I said, how are you doing today? Well, I'm a little discouraged, a little down. That always happens after you have a big victory. You always get tired. you wiped out. And I, I tried to encourage this guy. I said, God bless you for, for the effort you've put into reaching People for Christ. I'm, I'm excited about that. Why? You know why? Because I'm going to tell you something, my, my friends. My passion has been, since I was 16 years old, my passion has always been to reach people for Christ. And I look at people who don't give a care through the week, who don't even give it a second thought, and I just shake my head and say, do you even believe the same stuff I believe? That people that don't get saved are going to hell? Do you even believe that? Are you hearing me? I'm going to hold myself up as a, as a standard. I'm just telling you, I don't get it. Dell, I'm going to tell you, one of the things I love you so much about is your passion for the lost. You know that? That's why you and I are such good friends. We get along well. Because I get that. I understand that. I've talked to some pastors who said they won't allow Bible studies, other Bible studies. A uh, young pastor friend of mine, I talked to him the other day. He's, he's, he was an assistant pastor somewhere, and he's leaving the church. And I called him. I said, why are you leaving? He said, well, because the senior pastor won't let me have a Bible study. He said, I'm having a Bible study with some guys. And he says, ah, just come to the church and have it at the church. I'm like, well... I'm not in, into Bible, Bible gossip sessions. I'm just going to tell you that much. 
But if you're reaching out, having a Bible study with lost people and trying to bring lost people to Christ, you got my 100% backing. I don't care where you do it. And a lot of pastors are worried about that because they think, well, you're going to be teaching false doctrine. Let me just tell you something. You remember me saying the Holy Spirit's not fragile? If you're giving them the word of God and teaching them about Jesus Christ, you got my 100% backing, 110, 200% backing. Bring them to Jesus Christ. But Steve, you and I have some differences on eschatology. We have a good, good conversation. We're friends. We talk about it. We have some very strong differences, don't we, on eschatology. But you want people to get saved. I want people to get saved. At the end of the day, when you bring them to Christ, that's what matters, right? And he sorts out all the other stuff, right? Because that's how we can be friends. Even in the same church. Got that? Because he knows and I know both of us have the same attitude about this. We, we just study and present it how we see it. And at the end of the day, we both could be wrong. And probably are. <laughs> right? But, but we want to see people come to Christ. Let him sort out all those other differences. We'll do what we do. We'll be convinced in our own minds. Right? We're talking about a passion for souls here. What is your passion? Can I ask that question? What is it? What do you care about? The early church, um, many of them sold houses and lands and poured all the money into the church for the propagation of the gospel. Look. I don't think you should pour all your money into the church if it's going to go into the pastor's BMW or Lexus. I'll just be flat honest with you. I know there are churches and pastors in this town who are making indecent amounts of money. And that could be different at different, you know, different people. I may make more money than some of you in here. Um, but I make a lot less than some of you in here, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, my children make more money than I do. <laughs> uh, all of them. <laughs> uh, the truth is, the truth is, um, I think there ought to be an accountability where the money's spent. Um, <laughs> there's a fellow came to visit us last Sunday night. He's a, a doctor in town. He came last Sunday evening to our service. He came up afterwards. He said he wants to volunteer to help teach in our school. And we'll, we'll see how that works out. I don't know whether he's going to be a good fit or not, but he, um, he posted, I, I've never met him before. But he posted an advertisement about our school online back in November when, when it first, the news first went out that we got the Douglas building. And his comment, I went back and looked at it online. He, his comment was, um, all you churches with your big bank accounts ought to spend your money on, on the children. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> you and I are on the same page. I see absolutely zero reason, Brother Helm could tell you this, to have a big bank account in a church. I have z zero reason. M you give money, and the money you give is for the purpose of what? Propagating the gospel of Jesus Christ and doing whatever. You say, well, there's no money in the bank account. Let me tell you something. The one who we're doing this for has all the resources we need we run out of money, he knows where, he knows. And if we abuse or overuse or use the money wrong, it'll cost us. And there ought to be an accountability, ought to be a good accountability. But at the same time, and, it, and, and maybe there isn't always a good accountability, there ought to be. 
But at the same time, what I want you to say, see is this. Um, all the money that you give ought to go into the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, you ought to take care of your pastor. You ought to take care of the people on the staff. You ought to take care of them in a comparable way. Medium income based on their education, experience, whatever else. But ought to be, ought to be comparable. You ought to take care of them, right? But um, at the end of the day, that money should go to reaching the law. And that's what our passion should be. And the early church, that's what they did. They would sell their houses, sell their lands, and they would bring that money. You know why? Because they believed that Jesus was coming back. They believed it. And so they invested everything they had in God's work. Do you know what I see in our churches today? Everybody investing their money. And people that have the most problems with how money is spent are people that make more money than the church budget collected. There are people in, in the churches that have more personal expendable money than our church account ever has. And those people are usually the ones that are worried the most about how we spend our money. And my question is, when you get to heaven, when you die, and you're going to die soon. I'm looking forward to that. I just finished my book on Revelation, so I'm done. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Huh? Just finished it. I've got, I've got a, I've got a um, couple of days. I'm going to take a couple of days and go through proof it all before I publish it, but it's done. Finished it this week. I'm excited. Now I can go home. <laughs> but, uh, but I got a couple more things I want to write yet. But that, the thing is, uh, um, I was looking at Jesus coming back in heaven and the things that we got on the other side. I'm going to tell you something. Only what, <laughs> lay up treasures in heaven. Lay your treasures up there. That's what's going to matter. You guys that have invested heavenly, heavily in the school, God bless you. It's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference. We signed, we, I was excited about all the support we had yesterday. Wasn't that great, Ryan? We had a great support. You'll probably say something more about it later, but we, we, we signed some more students yesterday. I'm really excited about the, the turnout we had, community turnout, and how far the building has come. Uh, thank you for all your support on that. Reaching the kids for Christ, reaching them, right? And there's a lot of people that are giving, giving their money and giving, their, giving everything they have. And yeah, we're going to be getting short on money over there pretty soon. We're going to need some more before the fall comes. But, but uh, Lord knows that. The Lord knows it. Question is, um, what are you spending your money on? What are you spending your life on? What are you passionate about? Do you have a passion to preach the gospel anywhere, anytime, to anybody, no matter what the cost? Well, some of you, it's some, something you guys probably are not aware of. When I was a youth pastor, 1991, no, 198, no, it would have been 1989, I started a teen magazine called the Teen Gram. Um, in about three, four, maybe five years, we had a subscription of about 6,000 in 13 countries. Uh, the Spanish edition went to print shop in Mexico one in America. And do you know that I gave away 6,000 teen magazines every month and never charged, never charged a dime for it, paid for it out of my own pocket that I made. I was making very little money teaching Christian school, traveling and preaching. All the money came from that. You know why? I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you. You know why? Because I was trying to reach people. I care about that. That's where I want my money to go. You understand? I don't understand what church people don't understand about that. Don't you want people to come, stay out of hell? Don't you want young people to come to Christ? Don't you want them? Why aren't you giving your heart, giving your back, 
And some of you are, trust me. I'm probably just talking to people on the internet. And maybe people on the internet are, 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 maybe this doesn't apply to them either. Maybe it doesn't apply to anybody here. Maybe you guys are with me 100%, and I think most of you are. Why aren't you giving your back wholly to God's work, to reaching the lost? Why aren't you dragging people from the highways and byways? When I, when I was a kid growing up, there was a, there was a guy in our church. He was always bringing hitchhikers to church. Always. He stop and pick up hitchhikers. He give them a place to stay and then bring them to church. One of them was an alcoholic, drug addict, hippie, picked him up, brought him to church. One day, my dad looked out of his office and this guy, smoking a cigarette, long hair, was riding the church lawnmower. And dad said, who is this guy? And he went to find Brother Joe. I said, oh, I picked him up on the, and he needed a job. And I told him, well, you should serve the Lord. Here's the, here's the church tractor. You come mow the lawn for the church. And he said, I'll feed you. That guy is now my brother-in-law. Quit the alcohol, quit the drugs, cut his hair. I talked to him the other day. Uh, his brother held a gun on my dad. And the next day, used the same gun to hold up the, 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 the bank in Syracuse. They put him in prison. And he just died the other day. But just before he passed away, about... A few months before he passed away, give his heart to Christ. My brother-in-law led him to the Lord. He called me at the funeral of his brother. His sister accepted Christ. Now, you were talking, I don't know, it's been 35 years. What a blessing, huh? That guy, Brother Joe, was always bringing people like that. There's a young man right now that's, that he brought in. And the young man's blind legally blind ended up marrying brother Joe's daughter has three children let him stay with him for a while that young boy came became a preacher he came to me one day says I think God's called me to preach I said well amen but you got to get your own pulpit <laughs> so you know what he did legally blind bought a church bus bought a bus took all the seats out of it put wooden benches in it, put a PA system in it, and went to RV camps around the area every Sunday morning and had church in the RV camps. You know what that young man did? One day he came to me and he said, you know, he was a janitor. He was our janitor. He came and worked at, at the church as janitor. One day he came and he said, preacher, he said, I think the Lord's wanting me to start a church. I said, well, okay, you can't read because you can't see. You can listen to the scripture. God can speak to you. But, you know, if I was, if I was looking for a pastor, you know, somebody, you can't, I, I'm not sure that I would have called you. But he says, well, I'm, I'm sure God's called me. I said, let's pray about it together. We prayed about it together. He said, preacher, he said, I think God's called me. He went and started a church. Started winning people to God. Right now, you know what he's doing? Him and his family have got this ministry called the Old Lamp Lighters Ministry. And they go around and they pick up like furniture from churches that are closing and take it to churches that are starting up all across America. Guess what? Old brother Joe brought him in, dragged him in. He was bringing people in all the time. He'd always had two or three rows full. Didn't have to have a bus ministry. Didn't have to have a visitation ministry. When's the last time you brought somebody a little sea urchin from your, from, from, from your neighborhood. When's the last time you brought someone in to the church? When's the last time you dragged people in and filled a pew? When's the last time? 
Do you care about lost souls? I'm going to tell you something. When you care, you will reach them. Oh, you might, you might have to have them for Sunday dinner. You might have your house open every weekend giving them food to eat. You might have to give them a coat or two. Doesn't the Bible say that? Look what it, look, 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 look with me. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 58. Behold, ye fast, verse 4, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. See, you guys are fasting because you, you want somebody, God, to fix the president or fix the government or fix this or fix that. Fasting and praying for those things. He says, is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? is to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast? An acceptable, he said, you're sitting in sackcloth and ashes and you say, God loves this, this is pretty to God? The one that made the lilies of the field? He thinks you sitting in sackcloth and ashes is a wonderful thing? He likes pretty colors, you know, hummingbirds and stuff. <laughs> Your sackcloth and ashes is impressing him? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? Let me tell you something, Americans. We're getting to the point where you might have to start sharing some food. Are you willing to do that? Now bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover them, that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. He said... Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Thine health shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here I am. Are you understand what I'm saying here? What is your passion? If you want to reach people for Christ, that has to be, your passion has to be, I want to find people that are lost and bring them to Christ. Because here's the thing, if that's your passion, that's what will happen. If your passion is Sodom and you pitch your tent towards Sodom, that's where you'll end up. If your passion is the world and money and whatever else, that's where you're going to end up. But if your passion is to reach the lost, then absolutely everything you do will be to bring the lost to Christ. All of your money, all of your efforts, all of your energy will be poured into that. Look, it doesn't take dedication. It takes passion. Desire. You will feed your desires. If you want a Snickers candy bar, and I just made you hungry for one, after church today, on the way home, you're going to stop and get one because that's what you want. You want something, you'll figure out a way to get it. Oh, we don't have any money for it. You'll figure out a way. You'll figure a way. You will, to get what you want. So, well, I want, you know, within reach. Are you going to figure out a way to reach the lost? Or are you just going to expect someone else to do it? If you don't do it, who's going to? If not now, when? Oh, when I retire. Look, when you retire, you'll be more busy than you are now. Trust me. If you can't figure out how to do it now, you're not going to figure out how to do it then. And if you're retired, when are you going to start doing this? Well, preacher. I've been hurt in church before. Take a number. Who cares? So what, you say, well, that's, that's harsh. Yeah, it is because everybody I know has been hurt in church before. Because there's people there. I've been hurt in family reunions before. I got hurt at Walmart once. You know what I'm saying? It's like, seriously, I was at Zach's tracks yesterday and cut my thumb. Come on, Zach. <laughs> Better than Brylan, though. Yeah, I'm telling you. 
And I was working with him. Maybe that was a problem. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, you guys should take a break.